I'm Peter Clift and I would like to welcome you to the May 2024 edition of the U3A podcast. Here we are in the merry month of May and yet it seems only five minutes ago we were celebrating Christmas. But we have lots to celebrate in this episode of the podcast. We're delighted to welcome a new presenter to the team, Bob Wells. Bob, from Stanford U3A, is an experienced podcaster and I'm sure you will join me in giving him a warm welcome. In this episode, we are going on something of a world tour, quite literally in one case. Firstly, we'll be heading off to Italy. An incredibly genuine man that didn't have a personal agenda. His agenda was all about the mission he'd set himself to bring Italy together as a united nation. And then back to London, where we hear from a volunteer at the London 2012 Olympics about her interaction with star athletes as they were led into the stadium for their big day in the spotlight. You were told that you were not to engage with them unless they did to you. Now, some of them, like Jess Ennis, is totally in her own little zone and you just leave her alone. She just follows you out. You get someone like Usain Bolt and I mean, you know, you're, you're running down to try and keep up with him and stop him hairing off because he's just like that. He's an absolutely gorgeous guy. We go around the world. The basic schedule is I left St Pancras in August and a series of trains through Belarus to Moscow, and then the rather grandly named Uzbekistan Express, which runs from Moscow to Tashkent. And finally, we return to England for some interesting history. Really initially started with the Saxons. They uh, they built a, a little tiny settlement on the River Le- Welland at the highest point of crossing that you can do. And uh, they laid stones on the, the, uh, the base of the river. Staying with history, we travel back over 400 years to Stratford-on-Avon. And that can only mean one thing, William Shakespeare. Perhaps you have memories of battling with Shakespeare from your school days, And if I say that our first item is concerned with Shakespeare and maths, all your school day fears rolled into one, it may send you reaching for the off button. But tarry a while. We are going to talk about Shakespeare and maths. Yes, you heard me correctly, Shakespeare and maths. But why combine the two? Well, one person who can answer that question is author, mathematician and contributor to Radio 4's More or Less programme. It's Rob Easterway. Rob has written a new book about Shakespeare and maths called appropriately Much Ado About Numbers. I recently met up with Bob and began by asking him why he had chosen to combine the two when we usually think of literature and maths completely separately. Well, exactly. And it's not uh, an obvious pairing. It was certainly not something that I've planned on doing it kind of came about slightly by accident the happy accident was that i was asked to go and speak at a maths teacher conference in stratford upon avon and of course thinking what theme could i take uh, it you kind of it doesn't take too much to think well let's give it a shakespeare theme but i was thinking we could talk about much ado about nothing that's sort of about zero isn't it we did actually put together my friend andrew and i a, a workshop that was just loosely hanging on shakespeare ideas and phrases. In researching it, I began to discover other connections. So coming at it as someone who's more comfortable in the maths world, but searching for for words and expressions and and ideas in Shakespeare's work, discovering just how full his his plays and his sonnets are of mathematical ideas. So really, this has been a wonderful exploration and, and investigation into Shakespeare, which of course I did at school. And I've been to a few plays as an adult, but I'm very much the lay interest who's much more comfortable dealing normally with with mathematical ideas. You decide to write a book about Shakespeare in maths, and, and you do say that writing a book about Shakespeare is like stepping into a lion's den. There have been all aspects of Shakespeare being written about. I think you kind of more give us a, a view of the Elizabethan world. Well, it's it's it's, it's really... It was sort of the subtitle of, of the book is Shakespeare's Mathematical Life and Times, and really to look at not only the way he deals with numbers, but what was going on around him and, and to what extent that's reflected in his work. I mean, one of the, the huge innovations that was happening, which was a great discovery, was around his time, this country, England, switched from using Roman numerals to our modern numeral system, what we now what 
uh, sometimes referred to as the Indo-Arabic numerals. So Shakespeare's dad was the last Roman numerals generation. If he ever wrote numbers, it would have been Roman numerals. And so Shakespeare, when he learned numbers, would have been taught this new set of, of, of numerals to use. And he was clearly excited about it because it was so novel. And, and actually, one of the fun things I do in, in doing talks about this is a little countdown, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, what would come next in an Elizabethan countdown? And everyone says zero. And I say, no, that word hadn't been invented yet. It's a French word, didn't appear until 1650. Is it nothing, null? No, none of those. It's actually the symbol, what we now call zero, was called a cipher. It sort of all links with an era also of conspiracy and codes and everything else, but cipher as this mystery symbol that Shakespeare kind of sees. He sees how fun this is because it, it's a bit of a paradox. It means nothing. And yet when you stick it next to other digits, it can make those other digits really big. And one of the beautiful things of, of Shakespeare using this new innovation, Elizabethan innovation, in one of his plays is um, in Henry V, in the opening scene, a character called the Chorus comes out and basically says, uh, we're about to recreate the Battle of Agincourt, but there's only seven of us on stage. How can we get you to imagine we're more? Well, treat me as a one crooked figure and my fellow actors as ciphers, zeros, and then we have a million. So we have Shakespeare playing with this 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 new new idea to uh, to get the crowds imagining big numbers, something they wouldn't have been able to do before it was invented. So there was one little glimpse into is Elizabethan world and and Shakespeare's time. Large numbers were beyond the scope of most people to even comprehend, weren't they? They had no reason to think of large numbers. Yeah. I mean, all the big numbers we deal with today, things like property prices and distance to stars and so on, were just unfathomable. You know, and if you earned a hundred pounds a year, you were earning a fortune. So things didn't really happen in the thousands and millions and stuff. Although Shakespeare uses those words a lot, but they used for dramatic effect because they didn't reflect the world around him. One of the biggest numbers I, I in looking around, thinking what. When would you have encountered thousands? And I'm thinking in crowds is the most likely thing. I mean, London didn't have that big a population, but, you know, probably the size of a couple of Wembley stadiums, I think I estimated. Actually, one of the best places to see a crowd would be at the Globe Theatre itself, where they squeezed 3,000 people in. So that would have been a huge number. And, you know, the whole scale of life was so much smaller and therefore so much easier to be impressed by by big figures then for the other number which keeps cropping up which quite fascinated me was simply the number seven seven days in the week seven liberal arts and seven planets well at the time they were known as seven planets yes it, it is and it has that number has been a part of civilization for millennia you know why is seven so important there's actually a mathematical reason why it's important which is in the numbers one to 10, it's the weird one because all the others are connected to each other because three is connected to six and nine because they're all in the same times table and five is connected to 10 and, and so on and so forth. But seven, well, it's linked to one, but it's not connected to the other. So it's already a bit weird. And then they look up in the skies and notice the stars all go exactly in line with each other, except for seven things which appear to wander about the planetes, as they the Greek word. That's the reason why seven's so important. And and Shakespeare would have been a part of this. You start allocating seven to anything because it's it's deemed to be what what governs the universe. So as you said, the seven liberal arts to study, uh, the seven seas, the seven wonders of the world, all of these sevens, because it seemed to be written in the stars and very much a superstitious time. Another aspect of Elizabethan life was that they were incredible gamblers. And you do mention in the book quite a bit about dice and the game of hazard, which I, I didn't know, as you say, comes from the Arabic, doesn't it? The yes, that's right. And the most popular game, I believe, was this dice game known as hazard. And it comes from the Arabic word azar, meaning a dice or die. And these days, you know, we hazard is used to mean risk and everything else. And Shakespeare sort of uses it to mean that. Basically, the game of hazard was roll two or three dice and then bet what total is going to come up. Shakespeare himself would not have understood the probability 
but I bet he played the game and I bet he had a sense of what the good numbers were and what the bad numbers were. A lovely piece where you 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 mentioned Galileo who did mm. many, many things, but Galileo working out the odds of getting 10 when throwing three dice. <laughs> exactly. And Galileo, great coincidence, born the same year as Shakespeare. And we know him as an astronomer. Uh, got into trouble because he saw too many things through his telescope. And one of the first people to challenge this whole seven planets thing, because he saw some moons around Jupiter. So he kind of got locked up for that. And what could you do but, you know, do other maths things, including figuring out the tactics for hazard. And he doesn't get any credit for this. Rob Easterway and his new book, Much Ado About Numbers, which is out now and available from all good booksellers. And if you're interested in Shakespeare, maths, or history, or all three, then this book is a fascinating read. If you go to Italy, you'll notice that virtually every single town has a monument or one of its main streets or squares named after Giuseppe Garibaldi. But who was he, and why did he become such a hero? Garibaldi was a revolutionary patriot and military commander who led a movement that united Italy in the mid-1800s. He became one of the most famous figures of his time and attained immense popularity in both Europe and the Americas. Gordon Pincott is a member of the Warwick U3A group and has written a book about Garibaldi entitled On the Way to Capera in the Footsteps of Giuseppe Garibaldi. His travels while researching for the book took Gordon to many parts of Italy, South America, the United States, England and France. The book was published in English last year but will be published in Italian this June and Gordon is part of the book launch that will take place in Garibaldi's house in Capera, a small island off the coast of Sardinia. Susie Hodges caught up with Gordon and began by asking him what made him decide to write a book about Garibaldi. There were a couple of reasons for that, one of which was, this this all happened around the period when I retired, and I was looking for a, a big project to undertake during my retirement. And Garibaldi came up partly because I've been going to Sardinia a lot over the years, and Garibaldi has a very strong connection with Sardinia, and partly because I travelled a lot during my job, and I wanted to carry on doing that, but not doing it uh, as in ticking off places that are off a bucket list, but actually having a reason to go places. And Garibaldi travelled so widely around the world, he seemed like an ideal subject for a book following in his footsteps. And it was plainly a labour of love because you took nearly seven years to research and write this book and you travelled around Italy, Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, the US and France to discover more about Garibaldi and, and the impact he left presumably in the places where he lived or stayed. What were some of the most surprising things you discovered about Garibaldi during your research for this book? Well, you're right. It, it, he he travelled widely. In some places that he visited, he's forgotten. But in other places, he's still a very vibrant figure in, in the most unlikely places. So, for instance, in southern Brazil, who wanted to secede from the Brazilian Empire, he became he, he fought with the troops in southern Brazil. And that part of Brazil never got its independence still wants its independence now. And so they still have Garibaldi as a kind of, almost they use him as a endorsement by a famous global superstar in support of their bid to gain independence from Brazil. So he does crop up in the most unlikely places. He had an incredibly colourful career, didn't he? Lots of ups and downs. I mean, he was sent into exile several times uh, and obviously was a brilliant military command, especially for guerrilla warfare, I gather. Yes. What was the secret, though, to his success in his mission to reunite Italy? He was fearless, maybe almost to a degree completely foolhardy, foolhardy. But his success was that he was prepared to give everything, including his life, for the cause. And therefore, when he was leading his guerrilla troops who weren't being paid, he had to project that feeling of a kind of destiny. And he managed to do that through a combination of his energy through his speech, which was apparently very compelling. Unfortunately, there's no recording left of him speaking, but he had an amazing voice and a penetrating gaze. And he was able to galvanise people to follow him into the most horrendous of situations to fight for a cause. 
And what I thought when I was researching more about him was that he comes across as a man who wasn't interested in power for himself. Mm. I mean, that's so unusual, isn't it? You think of people like Napoleon, you know, who then wanted to sit on the throne. Yeah, it, it is very unusual indeed. And even those people who start out with the best of intentions, suddenly when they are in a position where they can gain power or money, then it seems silly not to do so. But Garibaldi was never one for money, never one for power. And I think that was another compelling thing about him in the eyes of his followers, uh, as well as the other people who supported him all around the world. He seemed like a, an incredibly genuine man that didn't have a personal agenda. His agenda was all about the mission he'd set himself to bring Italy together as a united nation. You talked about that amazing uh, popularity that he gained. Mm. I gather that uh, the United States President Abraham Lincoln offered to make him a general in the American Civil War, but he turned it down. I mean, how has he viewed in the States? Well, because of the number of Italians who are, live in the States, the number of people of Italian descent, I think he still has quite a high profile in the States. And uh, you're right, he was offered a generalship. He didn't actually turn it down as such. The interesting thing was he said he would take it on various conditions. One of those conditions was that, was that uh, the abolishment of slavery was made the key issue of the war, which was a political impossibility at the time. Uh, so it founded on that and founded also on the fact he wanted control of the whole army and not just a bit of it, which was a, a bit of his style. He, he, he was very good when he was completely in control of something and not so good when he had to answer to orders from other people. And in Italy himself, because I gather you've travelled extensively throughout Italy, how mm. do you find he's mostly regarded nowadays? I mean, is he a polarising figure in some ways? Yes, he is very much a polarising figure, far more than you'd think. Italy does have this divide north-south, that um, the north is suspicious of the south and the south of the north. So you have, particularly it does split that way. People in the south tend to see Garibaldi in a negative light, who someone, as someone who handed the south on a plate to be governed by northerners. But northerners can also be negative about him because they say he's the reason that the, the north got saddled with the south. So depending on how you see Italy, whether you're and whether you're an, from the north or the south, you can have very widely divergent views on Garibaldi. Anyhow, the book has been released in Italy in June in Italian. Now, how yep. difficult was it to get interest there in Italy for another book about Garibaldi? Because there must be absolute shelf loads of them, libraries of books about Garibaldi in Italy. Yes, there are. Well, I, I guess I had a, a stroke of luck, really, in that in the research for the book, I went to Garibaldi's house, which is now a national museum on a little island off Sardinia, uh, where Garibaldi lived for the last 26 years of his life. So it's a wonderful place because it's on an island that's virtually unchanged since he lived there, in a house that's virtually unchanged, full of his possessions, his record collection and his book collection. And, and I contacted them in advance to say I didn't want just to spend an hour there. I wanted to spend a whole day uh, talking to people who work there and understanding more about it. And I got to meet a person there who is basically runs the museum. And we hit it off. He's obviously a passionate Garibaldi scholar. He's also an Anglophile, so he was delighted to find someone who shared his passion. And he and I have become really good friends over the last seven years. And he was very instrumental in getting the book published because the, the museum has books published on a regular basis about Garibaldi. And he thought this was coming from a different angle. It's a kind of autobiography, but it's also a kind of travel book. And he thought that mix of things was really quite powerful. And that was the beginning of the process to finding an Italian publisher and get it, getting it published in Italian. It has been almost life changing for me. And then one of the people sitting next to me on the table when we launched the book will be Giuseppe Garibaldi, the great grandson of the man himself. That was Gordon Pincott, U3A member and author of a new book about the Italian hero Garibaldi, talking to Susie Hodges. Well, I managed to avoid the obvious joke, and apologies for my poor Italian pronunciation. Sports fans will know that 2024 is an Olympic year. After hearing about the history of the Games in an earlier episode, we asked for any members to contact us with their own experiences. 
One such is Margaret Nichols of East Suffolk U3A, who worked as a stadium volunteer at London 2012, and then went to Australia to repeat the experiences at the Brisbane Commonwealth Games. She's been explaining to Joanne Watson how she got involved with the London Olympics. I was already an official, but not a very high level. Um, so I wouldn't have been able to go on the field or anything. And somebody said, why don't you just volunteer for it? So I did. And I actually ended up taking the athletes onto the field as an athlete steward. And that's from there. That's why I've done more and more of that sort of thing. Have you any idea why you got picked for that very prestigious role? No idea. Started off, I was given a role in the cycling, which I'd never done. And then they said, well, if you're there for the rest of the time, how about doing an athlete steward? And I went, I'll do anything, not realising what it meant. So where did they put you up, for starters? That's one of the most important bits. They don't, as a volunteer. You have to find your own and pay for it. So we stayed in London, and we stayed just in an ordinary travel lodge. Then we had a break, and then I went back again for the Paris. It's difficult to perhaps encapsulate what the atmosphere is like, but it is extraordinary. So how did you find it? Totally overwhelming on the very first day. And the same for the athletes. It was like you sort of go through the tunnel and suddenly you're just out there. Just incredible. You must have been there on Super Saturday in the evening. Yes. And you had Jess Ennis, Greg Rutherford, Mo Farah all winning gold medals. I think all in 45 minutes. Oh, incredible. Yeah. I think you look back and you can't actually realise that you were there. Just something totally, totally different that I don't think will ever happen like that again because it was so new to us all. Are you allowed to talk to them, that the athletes, as you bring them out? Or do they engage with you at all? Some of them did. You were told that you were not to engage with them unless they did to you. Now, some of them, like Jess Ennis, is totally in her own little zone and you just leave her alone. She just follows you out. You get someone like Usain Bolt. And I mean, you know, you're, you're running down to try and keep up with him and stop him hairing off because he's just just like that. He's an absolutely gorgeous guy. So you've really got to gauge. If they talk to you and they want to chat, sometimes it's nervous and they just want you to listen. Other times they just engage with you. So it's a case of waiting to see. So what sort of conversations did you have? Things like with Usain Bolt, he wants to know what you are and what you do and why you're doing it and how brilliant it is to have people around. And please, can you speak your English language? <laughs> because it's so different to this. A lot of them just want to know why you're doing it and how incredible it is that volunteers are doing it. I mean, all of the athletes are so, so grateful. And they're just, I mean, some of them don't say a word on the way out. Coming back, it's totally different because if they haven't done so well, then it's just quiet. If they've done really well, they're full of it. Um, if they've done extremely well, I mean, they're just over the top. They just want to tell you all about it. I know the volunteers get your, you get your kit, don't you? You get your, your yes. uniform, yes. as it were, which you're allowed to keep. Don't you normally get a diploma at the end? To you, you get a certificate and you also get um, a metal baton. So I've got two, one for the Paralympics and one for the Olympics. Now, some people would think, well, that's it, once in a lifetime occasion. But you were so inspired by that that you went on to volunteer at other events. Explain a bit about that. Well, we did the Commonwealth Games in Gold Coast, thinking, well, we'll just go and have a holiday and that we'd just stand at the doors and open the doors and things. And then I got a, a phone call from Australia to say, I see you've done a lot of call room. Would you mind coming and helping us in that? So I ended up going and doing that. And my husband was on the field looking after the warm up people. So we had a whale of a time. So you better explain what the call room is. Right. The call room is where the athletes come into where we check that they've got the right numbers, they're the right people, their shoes the right, got the right um, spikes in, and then get them ready actually for the race. And then you line them up for their race and take them onto the, the area. Most of the athletes have done this time and time again, but were there any sort of horror stories, people forgetting their numbers or they hadn't? Oh, was, you know... we had one of the athletes who actually forgot his spikes. So he comes into the call room in his uh, trainer's, and suddenly realised he hadn't got his spikes. So we sort of moved around, found where they were, sent him on to his 400 race, went on to the 400 race, and there we were running after him with his bike. <laughs> How did he do? He came third. 
And he came back. It was sweet. He came back and thanked us all because we'd managed to get them on there. On the whole, most of them at that level, they know what they're doing. You do it at some of the low ones. If you're doing the national games and they're the sort of under 15s, then, oh, yes, they forget everything. Do you think there are as many people wanting to volunteer for these sort of things? I'm not sure. I think the fact that people have to pay for their accommodation if they're not going as a main official, I think that has put them off because things have gone up. We stay in a, in a hotel when we go and do the southern area ones. It used to be 40 50 pounds. It's now £100. Pounds. That's a lot of money to pay for even one night. But if you're doing it for the sort of 10 days, it's a lot of money. We're all getting older. I don't think the youngsters do volunteer as much, but I do think that is money. I don't think it's anything to do with people not wanting to. I think they just can't afford to. Are there any particular souvenirs that you've got from any of these? Have you got the number that Usain Bolt wore and he went on to? I have got one or two numbers that I saved, yes. Who have you got? Oh, um, I don't know without looking. (laughs) I think I just put them in a big folder. So I've got everything in there, all the information we got given. I mean, I bought bits and pieces and we had photographs done. So I've got photographs of you know, us in the call room. I can honestly say, yes, there's been lots of other brilliant things in life, like having children and getting married and things. But I think for anything else, nothing could better it. Anybody who has a chance to do anything like that, they really ought to go for it, whatever job they get, because it's a once in a lifetime. Margaret Nichols of East Suffolk U3A, who worked as a stadium volunteer at London 2012. As promised at the top of the programme, we are going on a trip around the world. Nothing special about that, you might say, in these days of intercontinental air travel. But Nick Harding of Ilkley and District U3A circumnavigated the globe back in 2019. Now, here's the important thing. He did the entire trip without using planes or passenger trips. It was all completed by train, bus and container ship. Lee Welbrook met Nick and started by asking him what inspired him to make the trip. It was my 70th birthday year. I'd recently retired and I've always loved solo travelling. I've always liked being by myself. It's a way to meet people, to really experience the countries you visit. And I like all the novelty of doing something in a different way. In other words, it was a challenge. I'm lucky enough to have a, a very supportive partner who didn't mind me disappearing for three months. And so I thought, why not? What was the schedule for the trip? So what was your expected time to complete the countries you went through? And did you manage to stick to your plan or did you have to adjust it en route? I very much had to adjust it en route. I think uh, one of the watchwords in this sort of trip is you have to be flexible. The basic schedule is I left St Pancras in August and a series of trains through Belarus to Moscow and then the rather grandly named Uzbekistan Express which runs from Moscow to Tashkent. Then from there after I'd done some exploring there for a couple of weeks Kazakhstan over into western China all the way through from the west of China to uh, Xi'an and then down south to Vietnam and Southeast Asia, so Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, where I caught a container ship. I didn't catch it. I booked it sometime in advance. 22 days across the Pacific to Los Angeles, where I then traveled on the American rail network Amtrak all the way through the southwest of of the States to New Orleans up the eastern seaboard, into Canada. I've finally got the uh, a seven-day container ship from Halifax in, in Canada, across the Atlantic, seven days across the Atlantic, back to Liverpool. That was the schedule. While I was away, my partner had uh, sold our house in London. So she met me in Liverpool, and uh, my journey ended back in here in Ilkley. So there's a whole list of countries there that you've planned to go through. So could you tell us a little bit more about the preparation for the trip and also what were the most essential items, the things that you couldn't have done without while you were on on your journey? The most critical thing was to 
find a company who could organize some shipping for me who would take passengers. And I found a German company who have a motto, which is the journey is the destination. And that's very much what I, I like. The company is actually called Slow Travel. So I liaised with them and booked, most importantly, the Pacific one, because that is the really big one. And relatively few ships actually make that trip. But I found one. I was the only passenger. It was French. So the food and the drink were lovely. And once I'd got that in place, I was then able to estimate roughly when I would need the Atlantic crossing. And then the next priority was getting visas, which some of which were very easy, some of which were very expensive. And because I was arriving by sea into the States, I needed a special visa, what they call a B1 visa. Insurance, I didn't need, but I did. I did get. Those were the time critical things. Thereafter, probably the next most important thing was to get uh, sleeper trains, but that was really only a week or two in advance. Most other trains, buses and things I booked on the day, the night before, hotels the night before. That was my basic preparation. In terms of what I took, the most important thing I would say is, well, two things, travel light, uh, just a couple of changes of clothes, and the iPad or, or the iPhone, or in my case, both, so that I had a backup if one if I got lost, when I lost one. All my information, all my tickets, all my photos, all my journal, all the websites that I needed access to were all there in my hand. And something like a, an app for translation, I used Microsoft Translator so that I could figure out in China when I couldn't read the script, let alone understand the language, I could get by. The preparation was pretty good. The only other thing I might add is VPN, very useful in China. Chinese authorities don't like you to use all sorts of things that we take for granted, like WhatsApp and Google Maps. And so VPN is a way around that. That was more or less the preparation. And then I set off middle of August 2019. If any of our listeners would get inspired by this and think, I want to give that a go, are there any other tips you might have for someone who wants to embark on this kind of adventure? Uh, I mean, several things I might say there. One is, it's not as scary as it sounds. I had very few frightening moments. I think you have to go with an attitude of mind, though, which is things will go wrong. When you're by yourself, it, it doesn't really matter. The ship's delayed 10 days. Let's find a nice island off the coast of Thailand and enjoy it. So I think the state of mind is probably the most important thing. And coming back to the the iPad or the iPhone, it's having that information to be able to adjust things. And the uh, Translate program I, I mentioned before. So I was able literally to stop people in the street in the middle of somewhere in China and say, can you tell me the way to the this hotel or the nearest uh, train station and talk into my phone and my phone would talk to that person. They would talk back in Mandarin or whatever, and I could understand. It was an, it's an extraordinary device for certainly somebody my age, the way technology has changed life. So I would say it's not as difficult as you think, and just be flexible. Finally, I'd just like to ask you one more question. Having completed this trip around the world, have you got any other big travel adventures you're thinking about or lined up at any point in the future? What I want to be able to do while I still can, I'm very keen on I'm going to southern India because uh, I've never been anywhere in India and to uh, travel around that part of India, by, probably by train and bus if I can risk it. I've also got in mind a little bit more civilized. I love the American trains. I love their, you know, these huge Amtrak trains. And I think to go around the States for a month or so with Amtrak and Greyhound buses would be really good fun. And of course, no language barriers there. I have this same German company that organizes container ships. They do various exotic things. You can go from New Zealand, Taranga in New Zealand, to Pitcairn Island. I would love to go to somewhere so remote and experience an island with 40 or 50 people who live on it. I think that would be an absolutely fascinating experience. Thank you very much for that. All it remains for me to do is wish you more and many happy travels. Thank you very much, Lee. Nick Harding recalling his round-the-world trip by bus, train and container ship. 
his trip was probably quicker than trying to get a train from Manchester to Newcastle. But now we return to England, to Stamford in the East Midlands to be precise. Stamford holds within its streets secrets of the past waiting to be unearthed. And we look at some of the lesser known historic characters who lived in Stamford. Bob Wells met with local resident Bill Cunningham, who is fascinated by Stamford's past and set about discovering the remarkable individuals whose lives intersected with the town. Firstly, Bob asked Bill to tell him something about the town of Stamford. Well, Stamford's been around for quite a few years. Um, it's um, really initially started with the Saxons. They, uh, they built a, a little tiny settlement on the River Le- Welland at the highest point of crossing that you can do. And uh, they laid stones on the, the, uh, the base of the river. And hence Stamford was initially known as Stony Ford. And that's how it developed into Stamford. We're going to go to a grave first. Oh, that's a, that's a nice sobering <laughs> thought. But... And we'll start off in a happy chappy called Daniel Lambert. And when we get there, I'll just run through that. Bit. Let's just find out a bit about you, Bill. What makes you so interested in Stamford and history and stuff like that? Essentially, uh, I'm a retired businessman now. and But all my life I had a passion for history. And now, as I've given up work... I'm fully exploring this passion. And now I'm also a guide at Stamford Town. Uh, we're known as the Mayor's Guide. Daniel Lambert was not a, a local man. He was actually from Leicester. And uh, he was the son of the uh, jailer of Leicester's jail. And he came to Stamford in 1809. And he had the misfortune to die here in one of the local inns. What it was, uh, Daniel Lambert was famed because of the the largest and fattest man in England. At the time of his death in 1809, he weighed just shy of 53 stone. And his um, thighs uh, were a a metre in circumference, and he was three metres around the waist. He was the son of the local, uh, the lesser jailer. Unfortunately, in 1805, the jail closed, and he had to exhibit himself. Uh, That was common in the time. So he'd travel around a specially designed coach, And people would pay to see him. He spent a lot of time down in London, uh, showing himself off. Strange enough, he was actually quite a favourite with the ladies in those days. Yes, the Georgians had very strange tastes. And he came to Stamford to exhibit himself. Because in those days, Stamford, in Georgian times, was a a, a very, very popular tourist sort. The communication was good because of stagecoaches. And he came here and, unfortunately, he died. Uh, He weighed uh, 53 stone. And they, it took 20 men to take his body out of the, the inn that he died in. They had to knock down the windows and the doors to get him here. Wow. And when they got to his grave, they couldn't just lower him into the grave. They had to build a sort of ramp over several feet to lower him down into it. How old was he when he died? He was 39. Not very old, but then at that weight you probably don't expect it too long. Yeah. Um, but to, to, in his defence... He was not a glutton. He had a medical condition, genuine medical condition, yeah. which meant that he got very fat. Yeah. He also was a, virtually a teetotal as well. He has been uh, here for about 150 He's years. He's a per- permanent resident. <laughs> so we're back now with Bill. We're at St George's Church, also known as St George's Square. This is, I think, where a lot of the Middlemarch series was filmed. You can really see the familiarity of the, of the building. So, Bill, tell me all about this place. Well, St George's Square is arguably one of the finest Georgian squares in the country, and certainly in the provinces. It, yeah, you're right, it has been used for, for filming. Middlemarch, a lot of Middlemarch was filmed here, and also Pride and Prejudice as well was filmed here. Right. Or sect. And to your left, you see uh, the building there, number 20, a very nice Georgian building, classical format, etc. Uh, but one of its most significant uh, um, a resident, shall we say, uh, lived here in the 1920s. He was a, a chap who was called Arnold Lees. And Arnold Lees? Arnold Lees, yes. He was, a, a, oddly enough, actually, a camel vet. And he was an extremely... So, sorry, can you just say that again? A camel vet. A camel As vet. creatures with humps. And he was... The so they, they actually had guys that were specifically involved looking after camels. Absolutely, you've got to remember, it's days of the British Empire, we had India, we had yeah, all yeah, that, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and he was a camel vet, who did time with the army. Yeah. In fact, they even have a camel's tick um, disease named after him as well. So he was uh, well-renowned, but he moved to Stamford in the 1920s, and he's a chap who was um, a uh, teetotal, vegetarian, animal lover, 
um, which was probably uh, suitable for his other great hero, Adolf Hitler, who was also another great humanitarian, uh, teetotal animal lover. Because Arnold Lees was one of the first original members of the British Fascist Party. Was he? Uh, run by Oswald Mosley. Right, yeah. Yes, he... So uh, we're talking, what, 1920s, 1930s? 1924 he came. 1924, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he was a great fan of uh, uh, Mussolini as well. Yeah, uh, one of the... Uh, he, he actually claimed that Stanford were the first ones to introduce the black shirts for the British fa- Fascist Party. Yeah. And he uh, was very, very extreme indeed. Extremely anti-Semitic. Um, and uh, he actually found the Oswald Mosley's British Fascist Party a bit too moderate. In fact, his description of him, they were conservative with knobs on. So he, he, he found it, you know, not, not quite to his taste. So he ended up um, uh, leaving Oswald Mosley's party and forming his own Imperial British Fascist Party. Uh, but in the end, he found Stanford a bit too quaint and mild for him. So he, he moved to the um, revolutionary town of Guildford and carried on from there. <laughs> but it's been fantastic talking to you, hearing about all these characters in Stanford. So thank you ever so much for your time. Um, before you go, where, where can people hear more about you and what you're doing? Basically, we, um, I, I do guided tours of Stanford, no, known as the Mayor's Guides. And uh, we, oper- we start at the Town Hall Steps, and we do that about four days a week. And if you search on our website, uh, www.thestanfordtowntourguides.co.uk. History in plain sight, as they say. And that brings us to the end of this packed programme. And remember, if you have an interesting story to tell or would like to contact the U3A podcast team, don't hesitate to get in touch. And you can do that by emailing communications at u3a.org.uk. All that remains for me to do is to thank all our guests and our presenters, Lee Welbrook, Bob Wells, Susie Hodges and Joe Watson. Studio production was by Lee Welbrook. The editor was me, Peter Clift. But on behalf of us all, this is me, Peter Cliff, saying thank you for listening and we look forward to meeting you again next month.